Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so we talked about the surjectivity of the period map. Um, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about during these lectures is a um, slightly different topic. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, hyperholomorphic bundles. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> Sorry. So, um, it, and it's related to the uh, to the twister families. So, um, um, and actually, uh, right. Oh, oh, no, no. Before we, I do that. Actually, I need. I wanted to say something else about the twister families, which kind of, uh, which is, which is rather nice. So, um, so there is, uh, you know, we introduced this uh, the twister family, right? We um, we took a, we chose, we fixed a hyperkähler metric, right? If each time you fix a hyperkähler metric, you have three, uh, well, you have an S2 of complex structures that are Kähler with respect to that hyperkähler metric. And then you can construct your twister space, right? Which is a one parameter family of Kähler of compact Kähler manifolds parameterized by P1. And this P1 is the P1 of the complex, of the Kähler complex structures. And the Keller form for each of those Keller complex structures is what you have here, this omega sub lambda, right? Okay, so we have this. Um, now we can, each time you have one of these, you can produce many more, in fact. So, and that is, um, uh, that is the, uh, use, that uses the Calabiao theorem, okay? So let me uh, explain what the Calabiao theorem is. Okay, so this is uh, Calabi's conjecture. And it was proved by Yao. And what does it say? Um, it says, so we start now with a complex manifold. And um, we choose a Kähler metric on it. Uh, with a uh, Kähler form. Omega and remember that when we uh, have something like this. Uh, we have the Levi-Civita connection, you know, for the metric G and the Levi-Civita Levi connection, we have the curvature of the Levi-Civita connection and then the Ricci curvature, which was more or less the trace uh, obtained from the regular curvature by taking a trace, right? And then uh, that guy was uh, symmetric, but then you can, in the same way that we go from the symmetric tensor G to the anti-symmetric tensor omega, we can go from the symmetric tensor, the Ricci tensor, to the Ricci form, which is now an anti-symmetric tensor again. So, and that's what we call the Ricci form. And usually we denote that row, right? Now this guy is, is a one, one form, right? For the complex structure I. And all right, so this is our data. Now we, we, we choose one more thing. So suppose that we have another one, one form. on M, um, on MI, of course, you know, it's with respect to the same fixed complex structure with cohomology class uh, equal to the cohomology class of rho. And if you recall, this is equal to two pi C1 of the canonical class of M. Uh, then what's the conclusion? There exists a unique Kähler metric 
g prime on m. So again, it's scalar with respect to the same complex structure with scalar form Um, so, oh, oh, actually, let me say that differently. Whose scalar form omega prime satisfies the cohomology class of omega prime is equal to the cohomology class of omega and rho prime uh, and such that rho prime is the Ricci form. For G prime. Okay, so what are you saying here? You start with a fixed uh, compact complex uh, Keller manifold, right? And you choose some one one form. Um, whose cohomology class is equal to the cohomology class of your Ricci form, of your fixed Ricci form, right? Then you're saying basically for any form, so what does it say? It says for any one one form which represents the class of the Ricci form, there exists a unique Keller metric whose Keller form has got the same cohomology class as your original Keller form and whose Ricci form is rho prime. So, um, so that's, that's the statement. And um, now it has a nice it has a it has a nice consequence for the manifolds that we are interested in, right? For remember that hyperkähler manifolds are what we call Ricci flat, right? The Ricci forms are actually zero, or if you like, the C one of Km is zero, right? So corollary. Suppose. Now I'm going to put the G in here is, is compact Keller. With C1 of Km equal to zero, then um, in each Keller class, and I will explain what I mean by a Keller class uh, in a second. In each Keller class on M, there exists a unique Ricci flat metric. By Ricci flat, we mean that the Ricci form is zero for that metric. Um, okay, so what is... Um, what is a Keller class? A Keller class is, is the class, is the cohomology class, right? So note, a Keller class, if you like, this is a definition, is the cohomology class of a, um, a one one form, which is scalar for with respect to some metric. It doesn't, we don't know which metric, it's just it's just scalar with respect to some metric. Okay, so um so these are the Keller classes. So what, what we're saying here for in the in the Ricci flat case in, in where C1 or KM is zero, which is the case for hyperkähler guys. So every Keller class contains a unique Ricci flat Keller metric, right? All right, so now what does it mean for us for the, um, for the twister families? So we're going to up, we'll go back to our twister families and apply this, right? So, um, Okay, so given um, let me see, I need to make sure I get this right. So uh, 
Okay, so given given our our our, our family, uh, this family that we had of x lambdas, right? Um, where lambda was a i plus b i plus c j, right? Um, in S2, which we identify with P1, right? For each lambda, um, sorry, for each X lambda, um, well, we have that uh, C1 of KX is zero, right? So for any, um, oh, oh, I, I forgot part of the theorem, sorry. Um, let me first do that. Um, okay, so this was just a parenthesis, if you like. So let's go back to the result that I was stating. So the corollary says, okay, for each time you take a Keller class, there exists a unique, um, Richie flat Keller metric in that in that Keller class, right? So um, furthermore, the Richie flat Keller metrics. on, um, what did I call it? I called it M on M form a smooth family of dimension H11 of M isomorphic to the Keller cone. Okay, so now we're going to apply this to, to our X lambda, where lambda is, you know, AI plus BJ plus CK, right? And this belongs to S2, which we identified with P1. Um, so if we apply this to that, what do we have? We have that basically for every Kähler class, for every Keller class alpha, and remember this belongs to H11 of M, there exists a unique, now that it says, uh, um, yeah, a unique hyperkähler metric. G, uh, let me call that, maybe I should call that G lambda, Kähler for lambda, such that the class of the Kähler form, omega G lambda is equal to alpha, okay? All right, so, so what do you have? So you started with one Keller metric and for, but for each Keller class, for each time you pick a complex structure, which is Keller with respect to that, to your original fixed Keller metric, uh, you can produce another hyper Keller metric. So uh, geometric, so, so, so then if you have a new hyper Keller metric, then you can construct a new twister family, right? So, so then we can construct the twister family for this G lambda, okay? So, so basically, so what's the picture? You have your original um, 
twister family, P1, right? Uh, I'm picturing this, I guess, really this, this is happening in the period domain, but each time I pick some complex structure here, then I can produce another one, right? This is the new one. This, is, this, is, this was for the original G, right? This guy here is lambda. And then this one is for G lambda, right? So you get lots of, um, lots of these guys in the, in, the, in, the, in the period domain like this. Anyway, I just thought this was kind of a nice picture to look at and it's useful for, so this is very useful for moving around, you know, in the period domain, right? So this is how you kind of connect things together. All right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about hyperholomorphic sheets. Um, when, how much time do I have guys? Uh, when should I stop? I would say in, in 20 minutes, right? 20 minutes, okay. Yeah. All right, I will stop in 20 minutes. All right. Okay, so just a few words uh, about hyperholomorphic sheaves. Actually, not sheaves, bundles. Sorry. Okay, so um, what is a hyperholomorphic bundle? So um, let, me, let me maybe just drop the definition and I will kind of explain what it means afterwards. So let's, um, given a Hermitian vector bundle, on X, we say that, uh, uh, let me call it, give it a name, vector bundle B on X. With connection with permission connection Theta, we say B theta is hyperholomorphic if it is compatible with all the complex structures. lambda in the S2 of complex structures that we have on our manifold, on our hypercalar manifold uh, X. All right, so, um, and this is, uh, okay. So what do I mean by all this? Um, so what's a Hermitian vector bundle? Well, it's a, it's a C-infinity vector bundle with a Hermitian metric. Uh, I'm actually, it's a C-infinity complex vector bundle, right? So B, uh, C-infinity complex vector bundle. Uh, 
is her mission. If it has a Hermitian metric. Which I will denote like this. So by Hermitian metric, it's, it's the usual thing. You have a metric on each of the fibers of B, which is Hermitian, you know, for the complex structure on that, on that, uh, on that fiber. Each, each fiber is a complex vector space, right? So we can talk about Hermitian metrics on them. And uh, theta is a connection. On B, right? And we ask the connection to be uh, Hermitian, which means basically that uh, the connection applied to the metric is zero. So the metric is again is a, is a tensor. Um, on uh, is a tensor, and you can you can apply the connection to it, and you can you can ask that it's zero. So okay. So this, this is similar to what we were talking about, you know, with, with, a, with a Riemannian metric, we talked about the connection being, um, uh, what did we call it? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, the metric, the metric was flat with respect to the connection, right? So the, the, the connection applied to the metric had to be zero. So it's the same thing here, except that you're in the Hermitian setting instead of being in the Riemannian setting. So this is, so we want this guy to be a Hermitian connection. And we have the curvature similarly. Uh, curvature of theta. This guy belongs to the endomorphism bundle of B, tensored with wedge two of PM dual as usual, right? <clears throat> and um, we say that uh, so uh, I said that B is a C infinity vector bundle. But uh, B is not necessarily a, a um, does not necessarily have a complex structure, right? So, if we have um, if we have a complex structure, if we are given a complex structure I on B, we say that theta and I are compatible if the, connect, the, the curvature form theta is a one one form with respect to I. Okay, so that's the compatibility. Okay, so now let's go back to our definition of the of the hyperholomorphic bundle. Um, so we say it's what is it? It's a Hermitian vector bundle with a Hermitian connection, and it's hyperholomorphic if it is compatible with all of the complex structures lambda in S two. So what does that mean? It means that uh, you can first of all you can lift all of these complex. You know, you, there's a lift of uh, your bundle B has a lift of these complex structures. You take a complex structure on your manifold, you can lift it to your bundle, and then in, you can lift it in such a way there exists a lift, right, which is compatible with your Hermitian connection. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I know it's a lot to digest and we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I kind of think of these guys as, um, so if you like, you can, uh, you can sort of, you can go to the twister space, right? So, so um, what's the intuitive thinking here? So you can, you can go to the twister space. Right? Um, so what, what did you remember that as a differentiable manifold, this is just X times P1, okay? Uh, 
And you can do the same thing. So you can put as a bundle here, you can put B times P1 as a C infinity manifold, uh, as a C infinity bundle. And then uh, what this kind of tells you is that this B times P1 has got, similarly to X times P1, this guy has got a, a structure of a complex uh, vector bundle, which is holomorphic. Uh, actually, it's a holomorphic, uh, it's a, mm, sorry. Uh, it's it's a comp it's a um, right it's a complex vector bundle which is holomorphic with, on on each of the fibers so um, right and uh, that's why we call it you know hyperholomorphic so you have a you have a family of C infinity vector bundles a priori it's just one C, a, C, a big C infinity vector bundle on the twister space but then on each fiber it is a holomorphic vector bundle and um, there is a very uh, nice result of Verbitsky which kind of tells you that uh, if you start with some C infinity vector bundle, then that guy is hyperholomorphic if and only if its first two churn classes remain of the correct, or remain of Hodge type. So, so what does um, Verbitsky say? You also need uh, stability, but so let's say given a vector bundle B on X um, with degree equal to zero, by that I mean the degree of the determinant. Um, so then if B has uh, a hyperholomorphic connection, Uh, sorry, sorry, no, that's not the wrong one. Um, no, 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 sorry about that. I, I'm, I'm, which I want to give you a different, okay. Given a vector bundle on X with complex structure I, where X is hyperkähler, um, if C1, and C2 of B are of, are of types, you know, are of type one, one and two, two respectively. So meaning these are Hodge classes with respect to all uh, complex structures Um, with respect to all complex structures lambda on, on X, then B is hyperholomorphic. Hyperholomorphic. Okay, so why, why do we care about this? Um, so what is he telling you? He's telling you, okay, you take your bundle, uh, your C infinity bundle, you put it on the twister space, and it turns out that um, it has this complex structure. And with respect to each complex structure on each fiber, if you look at the first churn, two churn classes, these are Hodge classes. Uh, so why, why is this nice? It's because um, then, then what it tells you is that these, these, these classes, which a priori are only Hodge classes, are actually classes of analytic cycles. So this, you know, this has to do with the Hodge conjecture, right? This is, this is, you know, this is a big thing. And um, so, so it's a very nice result. It has already had, you know, applications, you know, in, in various nice theorems, you know, for instance, um, uh, uh, Nikolai Buskin used it to prove that uh, any, um, any rational isometry uh, between K3 surfaces was, uh, came from a, uh, a map between the K3s themselves. So this is, um, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a nice result. So it's, it's um, <clears throat> and anyway, so it, it has already had nice applications. Uh, so it, it is, you know, it, it's just something that I wanted to mention uh, before, um, before stopping here.
Maybe, maybe I will stop here and see if people have questions actually. Before, you know, I mean, I can't really launch into anything, um, anything much more. I could, I could say a few more things, I suppose. Uh, are there any questions? How do these hyperholomorphic sheaves look like over the K3 surfaces? Um, in what way? Sorry. Like, are there some explicit description? Are these... No. Well, that's the problem, right? I mean, <laughs> they don't have explicit descriptions. I think Yoshioka has got some explicit examples of these guys over um, uh, for maybe uh, more for abelian surfaces than K3s, maybe. Uh, and and I think uh, I think Markman did it for K3s, or maybe it was again for abelian surfaces. I, I'm I don't quite remember. But yeah, there are some examples of these of these explicit examples, but they're they're kind they're very complicated. You know, you use some uh, 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 you use some Fourier Mukai transforms and stuff like that. So it's it's um, yeah. I could I could show you. I could uh, send you the reference. But. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But writing down explicit examples is not easy. Yeah. But I, yeah, I think Yoshioka has got some. And then do I guess people also study their moduli spaces if maybe. If what? Uh, is I mean, I guess I don't even know an example, so it's uh, too much to ask. Uh, it, do, what <laughs> well, do people? Yeah. Uh, right. Do people study their moduli? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a notion of stability, right? Maybe I can say something about that um, a little bit. So, uh, <clears throat> so let me let me maybe usually I mean usually you need a, you need a stability condition. So, so to 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 look at moduli, right? To construct moduli of these. We need a stability condition. Uh, so what is so? How do we how do we define that? So uh, you you first fix a Keller form. Omega. On our hyper Keller manifold X, and if I have a, you can define this for just uh, any coherent sheaves. Um, maybe I'll just. Um, yeah, I, I can do it for coherent sheep. So F a coherent sheep. Uh, then you can define the degree, first of all. Uh, what's it going to be? It's going to be um, one over the volume of your manifold times the integral over the manifold of the first churn class wedged with the Keller form to the power n minus one. So n is the dimension of complex dimension of X and the volume by definition is the integral of the Keller form to the power N. Okay, so this is the degree and then you can define, you have a, the usual definition of slope, right? So slope of F is going to be the degree divided by the rank by rank, of course, we mean the generic rank. And uh, so how, what definition of stability do you take? Usually F is called stable. And of course, it with, it's with respect to this Keller class omega, right? If for all uh, subsheaves F prime of F of such that rank of F prime is strictly less than the rank of F, we have that uh, the slope of F prime is strictly less than the slope of F. And semi-stable, of course, you replace uh, strict inequality with a large inequality.
okay, so you have uh, you have these um, you have these stability conditions, and then um, uh, then there's a there's a famous theorem of Ullen, Dyke, and Yao. which tells you in fact that if B is indecomposable, uh, an indecomposable bundle on a compact manifold, compact Kähler manifold, uh, then uh, B is stable if and only if B has what we call a liang mills metric. Okay, and a yang mills metric is um, a special type of permission metric. Um, so let me, maybe I can actually give you that definition as well. So a permission metric is Yang Mills if, if it's curvature form um, is a multiple of the identity. Okay, now that this, this sorry, this might not make sense. Um, uh, it's not the curvature form, which is the multiple of the identity, it's, um, you have to do something to the curvature form, right? I mean, the curvature form is a one-one form, so it doesn't make sense to talk about the one-one form being the identity. So uh, you have to, um, um, yeah, you have to kind of uh, use the use the use the Keller form to uh, to uh, uh, you have to take the adjoint of of cupping with the Keller form and apply that to the curvature form, and then you can say that that guy is a multiple of the identity. But I think that I'm out of time. I'm, I'm going to stop here. Um, there will be, uh, I will send the, um, uh, these uh, handwritten notes to the, uh, to the ICTP people and to post online, but there will of course be a, a proceedings volume, right? There will be an expanded version of typed notes uh, with more references and more details um, upcoming. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Elham. This uh, Professor Izadi, this has been uh, really fantastic and uh, worthy closure for a very beautiful summer school. And so my thanks go from myself and Ada and Valentina to uh, and Lota to all the lecturer to the two main lecturers to the exercise session leaders who have done an absolutely great job thank you so much and to everybody who gave a talk and of course thanks to the participants for managing through this difficult time uh other we we agreed that we are not going to get so the gather will be open but i think we yes, say goodbye sure. here. We if you want, a gather is open, you can go anytime. It stays open uh, indefinitely. But uh, uh, we would like to take this occasion to thank the speakers again. You gave us a fantastic experience despite all the limits of the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It was it was fun. Thanks a lot. Thank you and hope to see all of you soon in person yeah yes. yeah yeah yes yes if people are willing to get vaccinated yeah yeah well willing and able and able yeah that's right that's right most of the world still is not able yeah that that yeah. That, that is uh, the the problem that uh, yeah, some yeah. are unwilling and many more are unable and uh, and of course, there's all the minors uh, or uh, kids uh, who also yeah, the kids, get yeah, vaccine. That's also a problem. I think, uh, if we don't get everybody, uh, this is not mm -hmm. going to get better. But uh, yeah, 
but you know, it's better than we thought. I remember, you remember it said that there would be the first vaccine would be in September 2021. So we mm -hmm. are ahead yeah. of schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.